Make some noise if you can hear us, people. Come on, make some noise. How about this air conditioning? This is a place to be. Welcome to Sunday Assembly. I'm Darren. I'm Ross. And this is Sunday Assembly. What is Sunday Assembly, you're asking? We are a God-free community that celebrates a worldview grounded in evidence and reason. We invite everyone to join us as we do our best to live better, help often, and wonder more. That's right. Happy Father's Day, Ross. Happy Father's Day to you, too. We are fathers. Raise your hand if you're father. Raise your hand if you think fathers are awesome. Raise your hand if you've ever known anybody who is a father. There we go. Oh, good, this, good, good. What, what are the odds of that? Now, I do want to, I, I don't want to bring the room down, but uh, this is the first Father's Day uh, that we are observing since the tragic events of Star Wars Force Awakens. <laughs> a, that was a good movie. And B, that's, that's Darren's way of dealing with tragedy, so, you know. Uh, raise your hand if you've <laughs> not seen Star Wars Force Awakens. Okay, see, get out. You're the problem with society, you guys. <laughs> this is why we can't have nice now things. Now we can't talk about why it's a Father's Day joke. Now, I know you're all wondering, like, why does Ross look so unusually spiffy today? This is on my fifth... <laughs> job, there's a job interview directly afterwards. Yes, how did you know? Uh, this is the first time, as a father, that I have received Father's Day ties. So, there it is. Thank you. Hashtag Father's Day tie gift. I'm live tweeting this whole thing. I don't... <laughs> um, yeah, I, I never actually bought my father a tie for Father's Day. He had so many. So, he was good. Okay. So, so now I think it's time for some music. Um, so we've got, we are very fortunate to have, well actually, we want to bring up some additional singers as well, the Wonder More Warblers, so if you are one of them, come on up, and, it, and if you're just someone who's like, I want to sing on stage, you can also come on up. And you can't stop yourself from singing, the, come on up. Yeah, we're going to enable that, but we're especially lucky to have, we have Shelly Siegel, Shelley here, Siegel right? here. She's performed. Uh, to festival crowds of over 30,000 people using her music, not only to express the way she sees the world, but to create the world she wants to see. <laughs> For her first time at Sunday Assembly, please welcome to the stage, Shelly Siegel. Thanks, guys. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, about two weeks ago, I was at the Reason Rally with the, with the Sunday Assembly All-Stars band, who were fantastic. And um, this is my first time at Sunday Assembly Los Angeles, but I've played for Sunday Assembly in Bournemouth in the UK, in Melbourne in Australia, in New York, and I'm very happy to be here with you. And something that I realised this morning while I was getting ready and... Uh, my grandfather's yamulka dropped out of my uh, suitcase. <laughs> um, I remembered uh, where I've come from and the community that I've come from where I wasn't allowed to lead a service and to lead a, a congregation in song. And even though I've done this before, it made it feel extra special for me to be able to do that today with you. And so... In honour of realising how special that is, I'd like to teach you a call and response that's coming up in our first song. So, <laughs> it's a, it's, <laughs> no. uh, so, <laughs> so this is, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a CeeLo Green song called Forget You. And in the chorus, in the chorus, there's a line that comes in. It's a backing singer's line, and it goes, "Ain't that some shit?" <laughs> so, can everyone join in with me? One, two, three. Ain't that some shit? All right, great. That sounds beautiful. <laughs> My synagogue would be proud. <laughs> and uh, and so where that comes in in the song, I'll show you. We'll just sing that part of the verse. 
and the warblers are going to show you where it comes in. So halfway through the chorus, I'm going to sing. If I was richer, I'd still be with you. Ain't that some shit? That's some shit. All right. Sound good? So we're going to... Uh, I'm looking forward to that part in the chorus. You'll feel it. You'll know when to come in. All right, so here we go. This is CeeLo Green's Forget You. I see you driving round town with a girl I love And I'm not forget you ooh, 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 ooh. Guess the change in my pocket wasn't enough I'm like forget you and forget her too Said if I was richer I'd still be with you Ain't that some shit? Though there's a pain in my chest, I still wish you the best. So the forget you, who, 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 said I'm sorry, I can't afford a Ferrari. But that don't mean I can't get you there. Guess she's an Xbox, and I'm more of an Atari. But the way you play your game ain't fair. I pity the fool who falls in love with you. No, ho, 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 ho. yeah, I got news for you. Living with my little boyfriend. I see you driving around town with the girl I love, and I'm not forget you. Who, who, who? Guess the change in my pocket wasn't enough. I'm not forget you and forget her too. Said if I was richer, I'd still be with ya. Ain't that some shit? Though there's a pain in my chest, I still wish you the best Will I forget you? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Say why you, why you, why you, why you, why you wanna hurt me so bad? I'm first verse Now I know I had to borrow And beg and steal and lie and cheat Trying to please ya, oh, trying to keep you Cause being in love with your ass ain't cheap I pity the fool Who falls in love with you She's a gold digger So you should know Yeah, I got news for you I really hate you right now I see you driving around town With the girl I love And I'm like, forget you Guess the change in my pocket Forget you and forget her too Said if I was richer, I'd still be with ya Ain't that some shit? Ain't that some shit? Though there's a pain in my chest I still wish you the best With a forget you ooh, ooh, ooh. Here we go So why you, why you, why you, why you, why you wanna hurt me so bad So bad, so bad, so bad I tried to tell my mama, but she told me that this one's for your dad, your dad, your dad, your dad. I said, uh, why, uh, why, why, baby? I love you, I still love you. I see you driving around town with the girl I love, and I'm not forget you. Ooh, guess the change in my pocket wasn't enough I'm not forget you and forget her too Said if I was richer, I'd still be with ya Ain't that some shit? Ain't that some shit? No, there's a pain in my chest I still wish you the best with a forget you ooh, ooh, ooh. Time after 
after some time to picture me I'm walking too far ahead you're calling to me I can't hear what you said and you say go slow I fall behind Second hand on wise If you're lost, you can look And you will find me Time after time If you fall, I will catch you I'll be waiting Time after time If you're lost, you can look And you will find me Time after time If you fall, I will catch you My picture fades And darkness has turned to grey Your tongue through windows You're wondering if I'm okay Secrets stolen From deep inside The drum beats out of time If you lost, you can look Well done to our newest warbler. <laughs> that was awesome. Give it up for Shelly and the warblers. Yeah. Woo! Uh, I like two very different approaches to dealing with personal, you know, setbacks. Right. One is like, forget you. Yeah. And the other one's like, I'll always be there for you. Yeah. So, you know, pick and choose. All right, this is an exciting part, and this is like why we all come together in the first place. It's, it's a celebration. Yeah, we, right? get, we get to share our milestones. So you may have noticed as you were coming in, people are asking you like, hey, do you have any milestones? Are you year? celebrating anything this month or in the recent past? Uh, something that's fun that you can share with this uh, community? So we have some. Uh, first of all, I want to call out that Marsha's birthday was on June 14th. Where's Marsha? Happy birthday, Marsha. Hey, happy birthday. S speaking of birthdays, yes. my son Andrew Blotcher is here, and his birthday was on the 15th. He is now 15. What you got? Connor Conley, which is a good um, German name. <laughs> Turned 18, graduated high school, We'll be attending Pasadena City College in the fall. Give it up for Connor. Where are you, Connor? Yeah, there he is back there. Hey. Nice. Hey. Congratulations. Okay, Ryan and Sarah Sandberg are having twins. Yes. <laughs> They've been MCs before. We expect you to come up with the whole family. Not their own twins. Jonathan Kirkland graduated from high school, you guys. Jonathan. There he is, yep. You're gonna meet Jacqueline soon, but I, I just wanna say before you meet her, Jacqueline and Mike just celebrated their honeymoon in anticipation of their wedding, which comes later, and I'll be officiating. So that's, that's a lot of milestones. That's awesome. 
Now, Gina Kirkland is now a celebrant with seven... That was a good segue. Oh, you were asking me to help yeah, you yeah, with yeah. that. Yeah. With the, oh, I, I see, the, I see. Ah. <laughs> the American Humanist Association, Association. Let me try that one more time. <laughs> We're professionals. <clears throat> you read it. Okay. Gina Kirkland is now a celebrant with the American Humanist Association. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. That means she can officiate weddings. Now, if you didn't, if you didn't put anything down on a card and thought, mm, but now you're like, wait, I need people to know about something. Please stand up. And I think we had, is there an Ellie here? Ellie, come on up, Ellie. Hi guys, I'm really new to Sunday Assembly, but my friend Maya, who's sitting in the back, uh, is the girl that introduced me to this awesome community. And it's her birthday, not today, but it was a few days ago. And I wanted to say that in light of that, she doesn't really like her birthday, but we're gonna ignore that today. <laughs> um, to say she's an awesome human. She's the most supportive human that I've met. And every time I go text her with anything and like, oh, I did this and she's like, you can do anything. I believe in you. And if it's the dumbest thing in the world, She's an activist and a supporter of her community. She believes passionately and strongly. She's tiny but powerful. And I haven't known her for very long, but I just wanted to say that if you're ever wondering or looking for a friend or just looking for some support, go to Maya. She is awesome. Awesome human award. If you slip her your phone number, she will text you with affirming support on a regular basis. Thank you, Maya. Uh, Ross, did you have any uh, milestones? Well, my son's birthday. Me, me personally? Well, it's Father's Day. Right. Gifts when I get home. <laughs> Got a tie and gummy worms. <laughs> I really like gummy worms. Um, any other milestones anyone wants to share? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Donahue. Uh, my husband and I are from Canada originally. Uh, we had our daughter here, but we just got our green cards in the mail. So we're a permanent resident. <laughs> nice. So this is Simon Manfredi and he just turned four years old. Yeah! Woo! Happy birthday! I just turned, I just um, graduated from third grade. I'm now in fourth grade. Ish. Congratulations. Anyone else? Hey, and I know we're excited here. I should also mention, milestones don't have to be happy, wonderful things. You can also let us know if something tough is going on in your life, too. We want to hear about that as well. Because we're community. We're here That's for right. you. All right. So, just, oh, yeah. Go, Donahue. So I just launched a Kickstarter that got funded. We're already at like 200%, which means I get to actually move back to LA. So. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Welcome back. Start kicking! All right, so this is, this is an important part, LA, kid, uh, LA Sunday Assembly Kids. Oh yeah, child care. Yeah, and, and after this, now we can start swearing. Yeah, before we start using bad words, we're gonna ask the kids uh, to leave if you, if you to wait. To announce the time. So if you want to, uh, it, kids can stay here, or if you want them to take part in the program, you can uh, take them out to the lobby. And it's we a wonderful, have, fun uh, program. We have people there who will take them to go do crafts and activities, and then make sure to pick them up right after the service. And all you kids out there, if you're staying, I don't want to see this after 20 minutes. <laughs> we are welcome to stay. Uh, we also want to thank everybody who brought clothing for the LA LGBT Center in honor of Pride Month. 
and solidar solidarity with our LGBT community. Um, and so next month, as kids get ready to go back to school, we're gonna be collecting school supplies uh, with the Academy Project, uh, and that works to change educational outcomes for foster youth. So um, they all need school supplies and are especially in need of blank journals. So if you can bring those next time. All my journals are blank. I should really journal more. Yeah. Or bring them here. Yeah. Uh, and then there's going to be a blood drive here next month as well. So uh, make some blood. Okay, so uh, I think we all know that this is a secret society and it's really not culty enough it's not for culty us. Enough. So what I want you to do is find somebody in the crowd to pair up with, maybe somebody who's sitting next to you, maybe somebody that, that you came with, and I want you to develop together our secret handshake. Yeah, we're looking okay. for a secret culty handshake. So um, <laughs> make sure, I, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you get up and uh, pair up with somebody, maybe, maybe someone you don't know already, and you're gonna work out a new handshake that can differentiate us from everybody else. And then make sure that it includes your names said very solemnly to each other. Very. Very solemnly. And, and uh, please. Yeah. All right, so yeah. that's against the icebreaker. Everyone up, and then, find somebody. <laughs> and that was a normal handshake. Let's get it culty yeah. here. Okay. somebody new and that you learned their name. This is good. I like these handshakes. I want you to teach every one of those to me afterward. So this is the point of Sunday Assembly where we need a little bit of poetry. And today we have an original poem just for us, dedicated to Father's Day, written by Brian Felsen. So please come and join us on the stage. Excellent. Everybody give it up for Brian. Let's play chase, Daddy. Let's play chase. I bathe in your warm smell, the glow of your laugh, the furrow of apprehension, a romance reincarnate. I still took pride in my down until the cry. Let's nuzzle. Come. I won't harm or abandon. Looted of license to play carefree, and with these romaine stems to tend, I tendered basic training boxing training, bonsai training, for sweet pup, compliant baby. Hear me and cower when need be. And every night I sang you a lullaby, take pride in yourself, little pup, little pup, and play where you will, my darling baby. That map I used to read you at bedtime, you've made into your litter. As you grew, I tried to harvest cheer in how clear you came to see me, not as that scientist above, but as a hairy, bigger boar. And still scratched my head at how you scurried past my nags with immunity to the bribes as your once angelic eyes rolled heavenward. Sure, it hurt. Through hardened stare, though, still I saw my baby boy the gleam, even when you laid in our feeding bowl and sometimes lied. And through the fecal palimpsest, I made out shreds of grids mapping out obsolete touchstones of my own adolescence, pay phones, pagers, newspapers, where once we tumbled, the game became keep away until my clarion command, just clean your feeding bowl, clean your feeding bowl, clean your feeding, clean your feeding bowl, just keep our cage clean. Do your burrowing, do your gathering, keep exploring, do your barbering, or you'll get mounted. Don't be a lazy boy, you'll be sorry. Don't play subservient or you'll get cut. Oh yes, the trials. I chattered and you shut and shrieked at the engagement with the sapiens 
as they filled you with their poison, whose ingredients are also elements of our home. After that battering sound, that battering round, reach out, don't crouch, emerge. Your family is here. Make a summary, you're the victim here, or tell it to a friend. Make a summary, you're the victim here, or tell it to a friend. Make a summary, you're the victim here. My poor pup, I know it hurts and won't be the last. Clean your cage, make your space, lick and shake, have hope in hope. You are not stained. Ignore the sling, the sting, and stand. Clean the holy ground, breathe the dusty air. Your power wellspring is still there. Clean the holy ground, breathe the dusty air. Your power wellspring is still there. Ha! After many months, an ancient comedy mounts. The sponsoring of your seizing of my crown was me. I am to you to slay. For in your play, if not dispatched, I'm demoted to act the fool emeritus, old Tiresias, or viceroy of some colony to tax, mock, pity, blame, forget, expansion of your marking and my death. I cannot remain. Pack provisions for my caravan. From my distant corner now, I see my fellow inmates gather to hear my alpha boar proclaim, muddle, herd, preservers, and prey. This is our Eden. Through all the shocks by trickster gods, the mana gifting monsters confined in the runaway expansion of the world, the needle for us all. We weak our cheer and wait them out and cultivate our carrots of hope, provisions of thought to know and gnaw, and as bamboo stems, whose stems bend and stem praises of resilience. But I chirp of the roots unstoppable, often invisible advance in goodness, knowledge, sustenance. That tungsten light still shines enough tomorrows to point and plot and pot and plant and fertilize by the fountain at your feet a power which no prince nor president nor Khan can have or take. Your tap is yours alone from Universal Aquifer. We close our eyes and hear. The only thing to do is seek, protect, love, and bend like the damn bamboo. And drink. So hold to your heart this holy stem, the only rule. Don't harm. And when it's our time to die a little further up the mesh, may our intelligence, our heart, live on. Thank you. Give it up for Brian, everybody. I almost wore that same outfit. That would have been embarrassing. You had me at fecal palimpsest. That's impressive. <laughs> All right, so now I would like to introduce our main speaker That's today, right. and I am, I'm really excited to do this because, uh, well, Jacqueline is awesome. Come on up, Jacqueline. Uh, she uh, received her doctorate in applied developmental psychology from Claremont Graduate University, but long before that, I met her at Woodbury University, uh, where you had dual majors in psychology and fashion design, so she's just awesome all around. Um, and. Um, her areas of interest, uh, research interest include, I can do this, sensory perception, self-regulation, resilience, and, wait, give me a second, I'm getting there. Um, shoot, no, that would have helped. And, oh, the biopsychosocial implications of trauma. Yes. Give it up for Jacqueline Christensen. All right, good morning. good morning. You guys are so responsive, it's fabulous. Usually I have to do that like three times because everyone's sort of melting into chairs and it's five minutes in. All right, so I will learn this clicking, Mabob. Nope, too far. 
There we go. All right, how many of you have ever tried to take care of an orchid? How did that go? <laughs> so easy? No, no, not so much. Orchids are hard. They need special water and special light and special talking to, and I have to put ice cubes on mine, and now the flowers are dead, and somehow the leaves are still there, and it says something's going to happen in three months, but I don't believe it. So, but I, it, I didn't even want it. It was a gift to my mother who kills plants. I should have just let her keep it, I suppose, but it's fine. So I have an orchid, but they're hard. Now, question two, poll. How many of you have ever tried to kill a dandelion? <laughs> How'd that go? <laughs> Did it work? Yeah. Some of you it worked. What'd you do? I will. What? What? Round up? Kick it a lot? No. Um, so they're both flowers, right? But. Some are easy to keep alive, and some are very, very difficult to keep alive. And then you have lots of flowers in between. And this is a metaphor for human resilience. Some children, some people are like dandelions. They can, you can, I mean, dandelions don't even need soil. They will grow out of cement in the wall. You have some human beings that anything can happen to them. They go through everything that we would deem terrible, and they come out on top. Right? And they say, we're going to survive, we're going to do it anyway. And then you have some people who are delicate and they are fragile and they have a much harder time dealing with any sort of adversity. Okay? And, and so I want you to keep this flower metaphor as we sort of move forward. Okay? So what is resilience? Resilience is a universal capacity, meaning that everybody has it. It's a misnomer to believe that some people are resilient. People often think of resilience as a noun, and it's not really a noun. It's really more of a verb. Okay? It's something we're all doing. We're all trying really hard to survive. It's an evolutionary adaptation. Um, babies try really hard. What do they do to survive when they come out? Cry. Cry. Yes, they say, I have needs. Meet them. Right? That, that's an evolutionary adaptation to survive. Okay, and so, we, you know, we have more formal definitions. We have slightly less formal definitions. I really like this sort of second long one here. I won't read it to you, but I will highlight some words in there. Rebound is an important word, that idea of being able to bounce back, the idea of being able to adapt, uh, the idea of being able to develop competencies, all of these things despite adversity, okay, despite going through some sort of stress or stressful life event, okay, or many stressful life events. Um, and, and there are, I mean, there are beautiful quotes in the world um, that, that basically say it's not, it's not a unique quality, it's something that everybody has. And I like this picture of the elephant, a little girl drew this picture and she just says, she falls off then gets back on. Right? And that, I feel, is a wonderful embodiment of the concept of resilience. So there are various things that contribute to resilience and, and how we progress through life and whether we're a little more dandelion-like or a little more orchid-like. Um, and, and so we have what we call risk factors and protective factors. And I'm sure some of you have heard of these things. Maybe you haven't. Um, so risk factors is anything, as it sounds, puts us at risk, uh, for, for potential, um, it gets in the way of our success, I should put it that way. It, gets in the, it, gets, it impedes our progress. And protective factors are anything that buffer against those risk factors. So if we're defining protective factor, it's a buffer. Okay. And so I've given you several categories here, and instead of filling it with words, I decided to put some pictures, but I'll walk you briefly through each of those categories. So on the individual level, you have risk factors, and those are, are they could be genetic variations, they could be, let's say you are, have a gen genetic predisposition toward depression, or you have some sort of physical disability, or um, you have a temperament, you tend to be more uh, sensitive or quiet, and you happen to have ended up in a household that is loud and unctuous, and <laughs> you, 
you don't feel like you fit in very well. Okay. Um, so know that all of these things are going to work together. Your, your individual protective or risk factors are going to work in the context of your family and in the context of your environment. So you have individual risk factors and you have individual protective factors. So an individual protective factor might be that you are more like a dandelion or um, we're going we're gonna to go over some very specific ones shortly. Um, but I want to take a minute to also talk to you about this idea of person-environment interaction. Um, how many of you have heard of epigenetics? Nice! All right. Well, good. Then I don't have to... What? Smart crowd. Yeah, excellent. Well, you, you guys all know this then, so you can, you, can, you can come back in like 30 seconds when I'm done talking about it. Um, so epigenetics, epi meaning epigenome above the genome, this has to do with Though we, we do have genetic code that comes with us when we're born, you can think of those as like railroad tracks that are laid, right? And we do have that. But our epigenome is like the little, um, the little mechanics that'll let you change tracks. So you wanted to go this way and then a little switch goes and you actually end up going this way. Our epigenome helps effectively change which genes are expressed and which ones are not. So what's kind of cool is even though we may come with a particular genetic, uh, set of genetics, those can be shifted and changed throughout our lifespan depending on the experiences that we have. Okay. Um, and this is through often through a process of what's called methylation, but I'm not going to get deeply into that at the moment. I will say, however, they've done some really cool research. Uh, Meany and Sif have done some really awesome research. Uh, where they looked at rat pups and they put some of the rat pups with a good mom. Well, a good mom had some rat pups and then sort of a, a bad mom, a bad mom being she doesn't lick her pups. Bad mom has some pups. They look at stress in the pups later. Obviously, the pups who didn't get licked are stressed. Then they say, well, what if we switch them? What if we put the pups from the, the sort of not paying attention mother with the good mother? And then everything sort of works out, and that's good. But they say, well, then, you know, it, you guys are familiar with nature versus nurture debate. They would say, well, then, you know, one for nurture. Well, then they, uh, they, they did it, um, they did the switching again, but then they uh, injected a particular chemical into the brains of the rats who had been stressed out, and all the effects went away. And so they were like, huh, one for nature then. Uh, and it's to say that it's both. It's very much both, but the idea that our environment impacts our biology. It impacts the chemicals in our brains. So we could even come out more dandelion-like and just through a bunch of situations sort of end up a little bit more orchid-like. So it's, it's significantly more complex than I can cover in 15 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so then you have, again, family factors. So clearly being in any sort of um, stressful family environment is going to be a risk factor. Being in a supportive family is going to be a protective factor. Um, it does take a village, right? We do know that the more people there are, the better. Um, not when resources are limited, though, then there, there is a balance. Um, Similarly, school and work, having friends versus being bullied or something like that at school, as well as in the community, if you live somewhere with a lot of community violence or you feel unsafe. Um, another brief aside that I will tell you about is, have you guys, are you familiar with the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? Boom, one person, yes. So in my very brief aside on that one, um, Vincent Felitti uh, and Dr. Robert Onda did a study at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. They had a sample size of 17,000 people, which is a really sexy sample size. <sighs> Just, that's such a great sample size. And what they were able to find out um, was they, they had uh, the just, you know, middle class, average people who go to Kaiser fill out surveys about their health and um, ask them 10 questions in addition to why they were there to go to the doctor. And those 10 questions were about emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, having a parent with alcoholism, having parents who divorced, parental loss, um, seeing domestic violence in the house, 
having a parent who's been incarcerated. And just said, did any of these happen to you before you were 18? And then they added them up. So just if you had two of those things, three of those things, four of those things, etc. And if you had four or more of those things, they found that you would get your likelihood of things like heart disease, cancer, uh, various health risks in general, risk for suicide, risk for drug use, went up exponentially. And it, I mean, the graphs are beautiful. And it is correlational, but it's also sort of backwards longitudinal, right? And they were able to track them for a while as well, and they found that even asking the patients about that reduced the return of a doctor's visit in the next year. So just even saying, hey, did any of these things happen to you? Oh yeah, they did, thanks for asking, was really important. So this is, you, you have sort of the childhood resilience research meets the, hey, now we see what's happening in adulthood research. And if you, you meet them in the middle, what we know is that everything that's going on in your environment from the conversations your parents are having to the conversations you're having with your spouse to what's happening in your neighborhood is not just something that, oh, you can think about sometimes. It's actually affecting you physically, okay? So it's really important whether it's other, is one of these pointed things? Maybe, I don't know, the purple box. Um, it's really important to be mindful of how various life circumstances are also going to impact us as well. And we have may have, you know, we may have been on a trajectory like this and then something kind of happens and knocks us, you know, in a completely different direction. And our ability to anticipate that uh, very much matters. So I will briefly tell you about the Kauai Longitudinal Study, which happened uh, in Kauai, which you've never been to that island, you should totally go, it's my favorite, and you should go. That's, that's, that's the lesson on that one. Um, Emmy Warner and Ruth Smith did a study starting in the, oh goodness, I want to say the 50s. Um, they recruited 680, sorry, 698 children born in Kauai. Um, about a third of them were considered high-risk mothers based on uh, nutrition, low birth weight, poverty, et cetera. Um, and, they, and she followed them. I mean, talk about a career choice. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow people for 40 years. Oh, okay. Well, good. How are you going to fund that? I have no idea. Um, but she did. She's at UC Davis. And um, what's really awesome is so she, she followed them at various time points. And so in adolescence, she was able to look and... And so of that third that were initially high risk, about a third of those were on a pretty good path. And so then you could see there were still two thirds of those that still had some delinquency issues, early teenage pregnancies, mental health issues, et cetera. But then she followed them even more and when she checked in with them when they were in their 30s, you see that even now two thirds of that original one third were on a pretty good trajectory. So it wasn't like this for lack of a better word, death sentence early on to have had risk factors in early childhood. In fact, they were working it out. And so she said, well, what are some of the things that these folks have got that the other folks haven't got? And we see that they had found some positive relationships. They had found a positive work environment. They had perhaps found some sense of spirituality. They had become parents and been like, I got to get my shit together. This was, you know, like... I gotta do it better, I have to do it right. So they had found something to, to be able to move forward in that way. So what are some of the personal protective factors that, that we can have? And, and, and it's one thing to sort of look at a list of this like this and go, well, duh, of course, these all make sense. Why, clearly, if you have these things, you will be doing okay. The reason for, for kind of going back and say, what is it, what are the traits that help make us successful are really going to help us keep these things in mind when we interact with other people. Or if we have children, what can we help instill in our kids? Or if we're volunteering or we're in the big brother, big sister program or whatever it is, what are some qualities that we can help instill in the next generation, right? Or that we can promote with other people. And so clearly social competence <laughs> is a protective factor. Um, there's a website called Circle of Courage, um, and it's, it's done by a folk of um, a, a community of various Native American tribes. Um, and when I looked, 
I, I was trying to look at, at resilience from a cross-cultural perspective, because often when we look at psychological concepts, they're very much done from a white Western culture perspective. And so I said, you know, what does resilience look like across cultures? I think that's really important. And so in these little purple bubbles at the bottom, they also had these sort of four concepts that align really closely with what has been found in the research, which I thought was pretty awesome, because I don't think they talked to each other. I mean, maybe they did, but I don't think they did. And so with social competence, you have generosity. And I love this quote. It's by a Lakota elder, and it says, you should be able to give away your most cherished possession without your heart beating faster. And I, I thought, wow, that is really the essence of social competence, isn't it? Really that the capacity for empathy, um, altruism, being responsive, being aware of somebody else's feelings, being a little bit other-oriented, right? And sort of the, the, the inverse would be something like selfishness, right? Then problem solving. And so in that tiny picture, which I know should be bigger, is this really cool playland. They make these play worlds now for kids where you can take the entire thing apart and like build your own playground essentially. It's these blue box. Oh, I want to play with it so bad. But problem solving is really important because it requires planning and flexibility and resources. Um, my dad always said when I was a kid, he said, everything you need is in your reach. And we've had deep metaphorical conversations since then. But he meant that literally because he was an engineer. And no matter what you were doing, you could always find what you needed somewhere in your proximity, whether it be a rubber band or a piece of string or a paper clip or whatever it is. You're trying to do something, you'd be like, ah, uh, this will work, right? That's flexibility, right? That's problem solving. And so the idea of mastery comes from that circle of courage, okay? So being able to, to be competent and problem solve. Okay, then the other two are autonomy and sense of purpose. So autonomy has to do with being your own person, right? Being able to sort of go out, um, have a positive sense of yourself. Um, you have a sense of humor, perhaps. Don't take yourself too seriously. We do find that humor is a huge piece of resilience. Um, independence would be the circle of courage uh, pairing there. And, and they say make choices without coercion, right? They, they, that you have a sense of making choices. And it seems an odd statement, making choices without coercion. But think of a toddler. Right? Often they need a lot of coercion for certain choices. Other ones they're perfectly fine making. Um, but that idea of inner discipline. And again, you can see this principle across the world. Last is sense of purpose. And I'm, I'm clearly preaching to the choir on this one because you're all here. Doing something bigger than yourself. Which is, again, something when they sort of reverse engineer, who are these dandelions and what are they doing right? One of the things is having a sense of purpose. So I, I saw in the slides earlier um, of all the different Sunday assemblies, someone had a close-up of a little card that says, I find blank meaningful. And I thought to myself, that's a wonderful activity for sense of purpose. What do I find meaningful? Why, why do I even do what I do? And I don't want to push anyone into an existential crisis. <laughs> it's okay. We're not, we're not going to go that deeply into why are we here? Not today. Um, but I really, again, the, the circle of cur courage pairing there is belonging. And from a more uh, communalistic standpoint, as opposed to a more individualistic standpoint, um, that really helps with sense of purpose. It's very hard. I know we, we very much push independence in this country because it, uh, Hofstede's cultural um, categories uh, finds that the United States is the most individualistic country in the world, um, which, if you are in favor of this, is awesome. But 
what we know about social being is that actually it's probably not as awesome as it sounds. And so in order to be successful, we are social animals, we need, we need each other. And so it's very important that we have that sense of belonging, that we feel like we fit in, which again is why most of you are probably here today. Um, and so uh, Ella Deloria says, be related somehow to everyone you know. Right? And that, that is the essence of belonging and the essence of having a sense of purpose. Okay? And, and optimism is part of that as well. So again, that sounds obvious. Well, of course, if you're positive about the world, you have a sense of optimism. But you can actually help build these things in other people. It, it is possible. And how is that possible? Well, it's possible through caring relationships. So it's, so the personal protective factors are all well and good. Those are things inside of us, right? That, that can be groomed and honed, et cetera. But there's lots of external factors. Remember I mentioned the idea of person, environment, interaction, that can help us do that. And so these three things, having caring relationships that include high expectations, okay? and provide us opportunities to contribute are going to help us be successful in that way and help promote resilience in an individual. Um, and I like this, uh, my friend who also does work with me in this area, she talks about turnabout people and that these are, are people who helped you in your life along the way, who helped teach you things like to not take adversity personally. This is not your fault. I mean, you should accept responsibility for certain things, obviously. But, but not to internalize every negative thing that comes at you, right, as, as aimed at you, okay? Not to see adversity as permanent. The idea that this is only temporary, this too shall pass, that sort of thing. And then not to see setbacks as pervasive, okay? That they're always going to be happening. And again, some of you might say to yourself, well, clearly, I'm, I'm that person. Wonderful. Go be that person for somebody else then, right, who may not have those qualities. And, and I want you just to reflect for a moment, who was that somebody for you? I'm sure you all have somebody like that. I mean, who, who was it that gave an awesome human award today? Some, yeah, there you go. She found herself an awesome human, <laughs> right? who clearly is a turnabout person and has some of those qualities and is able to say, hey, you can do this, you got this, right? And, and we love having those, the, those affirmations because again, it helps with that sense of belonging. Um, and, and know that caring relationships, again, are not just sort of a surface thing. There's even a concept called social buffering. Um, Megan Gunner's, Gunner and some others have, have looked at the impact of having somebody else there actually mitigates our physical response to pain and fear. Like it changes our brain and, and, and adrenaline and cortisol and all of that in how we respond to fear, which is why like when babies go get a shot, having somebody there to hold them, it's a good thing, right? Can you even imagine being like, okay, good luck, kid. You just put the baby down, walk away, wait for it to happen. Like, no, you would never do that, right? Because you're going to hold that baby and be there for that baby. And in that same sort of way, social buffering is so important when we're going through any sort of trauma. Um, if you really think all this stuff is super cool and interesting, the Harvard Center for the Developing Child has some amazing videos. Um, and they talk about the idea of toxic stress and what goes from manageable stress and turns it into toxic stress, they have whittled it down to an absence of a caring relationship. Okay, so when you have to go it alone, it's actually much more physically damaging to you. Okay? Um, and, and this is important in all contexts, at home, at school, at work, wherever you are, relationships matter. Think if you've ever worked in a place where you didn't have good relationships and how toxic that was for you, and how you probably even felt it in your body, right? Like you, I don't want to go to work, or kids who are bullied at school and they're like, I have a stomach ache today, I can't, I can't do it. it. It does impact us at that level. 
So across the lifespan, so what do we do with this information? You know, I can, I can tell you like, hey, this is what we know about what should be happening early on, and some of you go, and I'm 60, so what do you want me to do about it? Um, across the lifespan, there's so much we can do about it. So I will wrap up. Um, so across the lifespan, we're able to look at things like um, optimal aging, meaning we have to recover, um, the, the, the better we're able to recover and adapt um, to things that happen to us. Um, a lot of that has to do with how we manage stress on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another piece that I will just get to, I know you're gonna be curious about suicide rates, so I'll just tell you very quickly. Um, the demographic with the lowest suicide rate is African American women over the age of 65. And what they found is that those women share social belonging, a sense of spirituality, hardiness, the ability to sort of bounce back, and a sense of, well, you just gotta keep going, okay? And so if we, again, reverse engineer that to how can we move forward, if we savor the relationships that we have, if we reflect on them, then we will be better able to make our lives uh, more like dandelions, hopefully nobody's trying to spray Roundup on us, but that we can persevere even in the face of adversity. So that's what I have to say about that. I also have another thing to say. I know, that was the end of... That was part A. Uh, I now briefly have a part B. But I wrote this part. Okay. So one week ago at Pulse nightclub in Orlando, a very disturbed individual took the lives of 49 other individuals, injured over 50 more, and changed the lives of hundreds of family and friends of those at the club. The LGBTQ and Latino communities experience senseless loss and a renewed sense of fear and uneasiness. This tragedy is one of many in our country and across the world that often evokes anger, sadness, devastation, confusion, accusations, rage, frustration, and perhaps worst of all, apathy. Immediately, we experienced a backlash of pointed fingers and a deep need to find someone or something to blame vitriol flung across the internet and televised media, sadness and feelings of hopelessness hung in the air. But we have also seen human resilience in action. Yesterday, I saw a picture taken at Harry Potter World in Orlando, at Universal Studios there, where hundreds were holding up wands, like this, to celebrate the life of fallen employee Louise Vielma, which I thought was pretty cool. So many people have donated blood, brought food, or found other ways to volunteer time and effort to ease the burden on those most deeply affected. Hotlines are opened with counselors trained in psychological first aid. Uh, a group of angels made fabric wings to wear to protect the funerals from warped protesters. Uh, and charities brought comfort dogs to Orlando to spend time with those in the intensive care units. Um, a GoFundMe account collecting money for victims uh, does exist, and the community center of Orlando is orchestrating quite a bit of support. On a larger scale, Senator Chris Murphy, with the help of other senators, spent 15 hours engaged in a filibuster on the Senate floor to advocate policy action. All of this problem solving and belonging and caring relationships. These are just a few examples of individuals and communities demonstrating the capacity to adapt to rebound, to come together in the face of adversity. Sonia Luther, who is a key resilience researcher at Columbia University, concluded that resilience, resilience rests fundamentally on relationships. By providing support to those who have lost, we can increase the chances that individuals will be able to persevere and that communities will heal. Words by a member of the Orlando LGBTQ community, Ivo Dominguez Jr., best summarizes a resilient call to action. He said, if you want to do something about Orlando, work to change yourself and our culture, that is where real change lives. Let's start there and together demonstrate our capacity for resilience. Thank you.
Give it up for Dr. Jacqueline. Woo! You know what else bounces back after being down for a while? My weight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for another song by Shelly Siegel. Give her some love. Thank you. Thank you for that inspiring talk. And this is a, a song that also touches on some of those themes of resilience and connectedness. Uh, this song is a contrast of two ideas. And the first idea is, is of our insignificance, our cosmic insignificance. So we look at the universe and we see actually it's not geared for life. We're not the center of the universe. It's a, a cold and sometimes uncaring place and our galaxy is heading towards another galaxy. The pending heat death of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> our sun is going to die uh, and and there's no one that we can reach out to, one that will hear our cries into the night. But <laughs> uh, at the same time, we have what I'll call this real world significance because we are significant to each other. Undeniably, the way that we treat each other, the way that we treat ourselves, the way that we speak to each other, the way that we speak to ourselves, the beliefs that we hold, the thoughts that we have in our mind, they shape us, they, they create the world around us. Is that we have a tangible impact on ourselves, on each other, and on this world right here and right now. And it's incredibly empowering. And so I like to contrast those two ideas, our cosmic insignificance. And the answer to that is our real world significance to ourselves and each other. And this song is called Apocalyptic Love Song, and I dedicate it to Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> One day the sun is going to die. For us it means no more sunsets to the universe, just one less star in the sky. And almost all who ever lived have already died. Count the stories of love and war and hope and pain now silently side by side. And yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye. And the history of the earth is with each moment that goes by. But this moment that I'm with you, it feels like time has stood still. It feels somehow like it matters, and that it always will. In one billion years, the oceans will dry. While somehow life may continue, it will not be known to you and I. To think we are so important is an obvious crime. We know that we are specks on a tiny dot hurtling through space and time. Yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye. And the history of the earth is with each moment that goes by. But this moment that I'm with you feels like time has stood still. It feels somehow like it matters. And then it always will. Whole life 
is just the blink of an eye and the history of the earth is with each moment that goes by but this moment that i we're here with you it feels like time has stood still it feels somehow like it matters and then Thank you so much. Oh man, that was awesome. Um, I'd like to welcome up Mike Monty. This is gonna be the next session, section where we talk about doing our best, the little ways that uh, we all make the world a little better place. Hey guys. So I, uh, I wasn't a volunteer voluntarily. I, um, a friend of mine came up to me and said, hey, would you like to teach sex ed to kindergartners? <laughs> and I was like, that would be a good Facebook post. <laughs> but uh, about a week later, I couldn't think of uh, a valid excuse or muster the courage to stand up for my lazy side. So I ended up doing it. They, uh, but they didn't give me kindergartners, they gave me fifth graders, and I wasn't emotionally prepared to deal with their questions. <laughs> uh, one thing, though, we had this, this exercise where uh, it was, we asked them, should girls be allowed to play football? Stand over there if you're yes, stand over there if you're no. And this, I'm just glad that these kids are gonna be around taking care of me when I'm older. Because they didn't go to, they, they weren't, it wasn't black and white. They were in the middle and they were discussing things. And they were open-minded enough to shift their positions based on the reasons the other kids gave. So uh, the bottom line is I'm, I'm not smarter than the fifth grader. I wish I was. <laughs> and then, then after the fifth graders, I finally got to work with the kindergartners. I was looking forward to it because, you know, they say the funniest shit and I just, I was looking forward to it until I read the curriculum and there was so much singing on my part and that's like, that's, that's like one of my worst fears. It's up there with volunteering and public speaking. Uh, but, uh, I did it, and there was this one, and this is actually gonna segue into Wonder More, because I was, we had this discussion that was about family configuration, and it was, it was namely, you know, when you have a, a little brother or a little sister come into, a, come into the situation, and we, we talked about the range of emotions you may go through. So you may be, you know, sad or angry that, your parents aren't spending time with you, uh, the baby keeps you up at night, or you can be happy because you know, they smile at you, they giggle, it's funny. And then we gave them some Play-Doh. Say, here, show me sad feelings. After 10 minutes, we asked them, hey, show, let's discuss this. What did you make? Uh, I made a donut, it transformed into a ball. What about you? I made a volcano. <laughs> you, well, I made some lava. It's like, oh, great. So this is the Wonder More bit. It's like, I'm 42 years old. I've been to college. I've been to grad school. I've been married, so I've been to counseling. <laughs> I, uh, I wonder how I would do with the same assignment. And I figured, you know, I could probably, if I was lucky, come up with a slightly more sophisticated volcano. Um, but. I'm, I'm glad that I wasn't clever enough to come up with an excuse because I, I really do think that uh, it's, it, it was just, it was great. It was fun. I have stories to tell my mom when she asks, what do you do? Give her something actually substantial other than, you know, play on my phone. Um, and I'm gonna leave you with uh, one thing. Uh, I don't have any cute or funny stories about CASA, 
It's a core point special advocates program. Uh, but you can talk to me afterwards and I'll give you the point of contact. So I just wanted to throw that plug in there. And that's all I got. Give it up for Mike, everybody. Let him hear it. All right, now we're going to do enjoy a little bit of reflecting. This is going to be just a little moment of silence where we don't tell you what to think. You get to think whatever you want. Maybe think about all the stuff that you heard here today. Maybe what think have we learned? Go ahead. Yeah, maybe think about uh, the people in your life that help you be resilient or how you can help others. Yeah. And so we're going to do it with some awesome music. So if you enjoy the air conditioning here, <laughs> if you enjoy the coffee, if you like cream with your coffee, please help us out because uh, this... Everything we do at Sunday Assembly is volunteer based, uh, but uh, we collect money to help with renting this hall, the aforementioned air conditioning, mm -hmm. uh, all the snacks uh, that you get to enjoy afterward. Uh, so. Yeah, help out as you can. Uh, if you have credit cards, there are people with uh, square readers, so just kind of like lift up your wallet or credit, I don't know, like signal them with your hand. Uh -huh. And uh, volunteers will be going around. At this moment, also, we'd like to uh, talk a bit about, um, uh, we're going to bring up Amy to talk about the Reason Rally, or at least show us a bit of what happened recently. <laughs> no? OK. Well, here's Amy anyway. Wow, cool. Uh, we have a photo, right? Sure. Yeah, it's been a busy month in Sunday Assembly Land. Uh, you may have seen a video before the assembly started uh, that screened at the annual Sunday Assembly Conference, the international conference that happened in lovely Utrecht, Netherlands. Uh, Jeff was there. And uh, we had Sean there as well. Uh, that's where we get together and, and decide. I don't know if you guys know, but there's over 70 of these throughout the world. Sunday assemblies everywhere. There's communities just like this one. Um, some of them, you know, small, and, and some of them in areas where uh, people have trouble admitting to, uh, to, to being secular in public. So it's, it's really important uh, for us to keep fostering that sense of community. Uh, and there's this whole government structure and we get together and we vote on these initiatives so that we can keep running assemblies throughout the world. Uh, so that was cool, that was a big deal. And that was May 19th. Uh, and then on June 4th was the Reason Rally, the biggest gathering of uh, secular people, people working toward the separation of church and state uh, in the country. Uh, and Sunday Assembly for the first time was there. <laughs> Uh, and Sh Shelly Seagal was there too. She was on the big stage. So we had a booth at the Reason Rally. We talked to thousands of people about Sunday Assembly, which was amazing. It was uh, really well received. It was really cool. It was really, really hot. Um, so we gave these out. That was good, as well as uh, some high fives. And then we put on a whole assembly the next day at the mini conference uh, and had the Sunday Assembly All-Star Band, which had members from lots of different assemblies, but especially Nashville, because they're really good. Uh, and that, that was amazing. And then the next weekend here in LA again, uh, we did Pride. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, brave marchers, over 20 of us out there. And we had a booth and again, had thousands of conversations uh, with people right here in our communities, uh, making sure that people know about Sunday Assembly, if, it, if that's something that appeals to them, uh, where they can find community. Is anyone here today because they met us at Pride? Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. Welcome. Um, so just thanks for everyone who helped out with all of that. Uh, and just so you get a little bit of an update, we're doing things all the time throughout the community uh, and all over the country and all over the world uh, to support Sunday Assembly uh, and other people in our larger global community. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all for your donations. If you would like, there's a thing online where you can create a robot that reaches into your bank account every month. Mm -hmm. Yeah and grabs a little bit out, you won't even, it won't hurt. You won't even notice it sometimes. And uh, you can do that and give and give and give and give. That's at sundayassemblyla.org. And you may notice people with the fancy green name badges. Uh, that means that they are, are folks who have been regularly supporting us and what we do here. So if you see them, thank them. And, uh, and if you're green with NV, you can uh, sign up as well. So before uh, Shelly comes back on and does another song, we want to do a little uh, announcements. closing announcements. Uh, the Sunday Social is on Saturday this month uh, because we're celebrating the summer solstice at Dockweiler Beach on June 25th at uh, 10 p.m. Join us to roast marshmallows, watch the sunset, play music, celebrate one life that we have together. RSVP on that same website. And... Uh, you can find trivia nights, discussion groups, and a lot of other There's a lot there. going on. There's like music nights, there's book clubs, there's all kinds of things. So if you're looking for s social gathering, entertainment, go to sundayassemblyla.org, sign up. And our next Sunday assembly is going to be on July 10th. So come back here for that. We're going to have astrophysicist and podcast host, Dr. Sabrina Steerwalt. And the theme is going to be putting the fem back in STEM. So what would that be? Stefan. Gesundheit. Yes. Um, and our musical guests are the Evangenitals. I assume that's not a typing error. Yeah. And yeah. And there's going to be a, a, a blood donation. So again, stock up on blood. Uh, uh, stick around for coffee and cake and conversations until 1.15. And then around 1.30, everyone who wants can meet across the street at Oinkster. Everyone's welcome. All right. And, uh, oh. well, thank you to everybody who contributed, but we want to finish this up with a last song with Shelly Siegel. So bring it on up. Well, she's getting ready. Thank you, Jacqueline, Brian, Mike, and our video and audio volunteers uh, for being such a great part of this assembly. And, of course, to uh, Shelly Siegel and Ross... Give and it up for Darren. Ross, everybody. And I'm here. Darren. Woo. And Gina. Woo. What about Gina? Yeah. All right. Enjoy one last song. Go ahead, stand okay. up for this. Do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get ready for some freestyle dance, you guys. First, I was afraid, I was petrified, kept thinking I could never live without you by my side, and I spent so many nights just thinking how you did me wrong, and I grew strong, and I learned how to get along, and so you're back from outer space, I just walked in to find you here with that sad look upon your face, I should have Lock. I should have made you leave your key If I had known for just one second You'd be back to bother me Go on now, go Walk out the door Just turn around now Cause you're not welcome anymore Weren't you the one who tried to break me with goodbye? Did you think I'd crumble? Did you think I'd lay down and die? Oh no, not I I will survive for as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all my life to live, and I've got all my love to give, and I'll survive. I will survive. Hey, hey. Took all the strength I had not to fall apart Kept trying hard to mend 
the pieces of my broken heart And oh, so many nights just feeling sorry for myself I used to cry Now I hold my head up high and you see me Somebody new I'm not that chained up little person still in love with you and so you felt like dropping in and just expect me to be free. Now I'm saving all my loving for someone who's loving me. Go on now, go. Walk out the door. Just turn around now. Cause you're not welcome anymore. Weren't you the one who tried to break me with goodbye? Did you think I'd crumble? Did you think I'd lay down and die? Oh, no, not I. I will survive. For as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all my life to live, and I've got all my love to give, and I'll survive. I will survive. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well done to the Wobblers. Thanks so much. <laughs>